Good evening, everyone. Today is Tuesday, December 21st, and welcome to the meeting of Central Jersey Electric Auto Association. Uh, today is, uh, is the last uh, meeting of the year, 2021, and uh, we have uh, wonderful speakers today lined up uh, with the common topic of creating partnerships, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and RideWise. So, um, I will start with a short chair report and then we'll go straight into it. Uh, we have Colleen Oropesa uh, from Department of Environmental Protection, Bureau of Mobile Resources, uh, and uh, Leanne McGowan uh, from RideWise. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll go into some social stuff like uh, Winter Wonderlies show drive through. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm so excited about so many uh, new electric vehicles coming up, um, uh, like uh, the base model uh, uh, Hyundai Ionic EV, uh, Ionic 5, which uh, comes with uh, 220 electric miles and uh, base uh, pricing less than 40 grand. And also I read article that uh, the Volkswagen ID4 uh, that will be uh, coming from uh, from manufacturing facility in uh, Chattanooga in United States. Uh, the base model will be 36 grand. So that's all before uh, the incentives. Um, we got uh, already uh, Hummer EV um, first delivery. We got the uh, Rivian EV first delivery. And uh, also early in 2022, we will have um, uh, Ford uh, F-150 pickup truck Lightning. So, um, so yeah, and I also want to mention that we actually have uh, uh, meeting archives. I didn't stress it out before, but uh, since uh, 20, uh, since November 2020, so that's more than a year ago, uh, we have uh, all recordings, all meetings recorded on YouTube, and they're accessible if you hit the link. Um, and uh, so, for example, the most uh, recent recording from November 17th, Streamlight Charging with Aeon Charge and Harbor Keepers, and my report on buying used EVs. So I st strongly recommend that. Uh, the most popular recording is uh, Plug Zero Charging and Installing Your Own EVSE. Uh, so that was very exciting. Um, and also uh, we have recording from Drive Electric Earth Day presentation, the rise of the Gen, Gen Z electric driver and uh, trip reports, um, Polo shirt distribution and electric um, EAA flag transfer. So I will uh, pause for now and um, I'm going to transfer to our first speaker. Um, and our first speaker, let me share a different screen. Um, wait a second. Here. Okay. Um, Uh, do you see the first slide? Yes, we see it. Okay, so let me introduce uh, Colleen. Um, Colleen, will you come first? Sure. Okay, so um, um, uh, as a member of uh, the electric vehicle team, uh, Colleen Oropesa at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, she works uh, to develop implement and promote strategies to speed the adoption of electric vehicles and the deployment of charging stations statewide. Uh, she helps administer funding for charging stations through NJDEP's It Pays to Plug-in grants and other electric vehicle initiatives like the e-mobility program, which bring clean transportation options to underserved communities through electric ride sharing and ride hailing, electric taxis, shuttle services, and more. So, 
going to put it on the whole screen. Great. Colleen, it's all yours. Thank you, Stan. Um, thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about our programs. Um, I will be going over some of the state's EV programs and how our partners and advocates can help us accelerate the widespread adoption of EVs. But first, I wanted to briefly talk about why we have these incentives. Um, you can go to the next slide, Stan. Sure. Okay, so why electric vehicles? Um, we know that greenhouse gas emissions contribute to climate change and that climate change has environmental impacts, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, more extreme weather events, um, but it also has adverse health impacts. And in New Jersey and most of the country, transportation is and has been the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. We also know that reducing other air pollutants like NOx and particulate matter is just as important for our health and air quality. Um, and for these sources, transportation is again, a significant contributor. So by moving towards electrification, we are addressing these concerns because even when you factor in the power plants generating electricity to power the batteries, EVs are significantly cleaner than gas and diesel vehicles. Um, you can go to the next slide. Oh, it's a little hard to read, but I'll, I'll go through it. Um, as you all may know, Governor Murphy signed the EV law back in 2020, establishing some very ambitious goals, including to have 330,000 light duty EVs on the road by the end of 2025. And that number jumps to 2 million by 2035. Um, there's also ambitious infrastructure goals to match. And to give some perspective on exactly what we mean by accelerated EV adoption, as of June of this year, um, we have just under 50,000 EVs registered in New Jersey. So we'll have to gain nearly seven times that in about the next four years or so in order to meet that goal. Um, so next I'll be going through the state's EV programs that we work on with some of our sister agencies. And you'll see that these incentives are targeted at accomplishing the goals of that EV law. Um, this is DEP's flyer, which has resources um, for local governments, including a list of EVs on the state purchasing contracts. We also very recently added an incentive summary um, to our Drive Green website. The state has a lot of different programs depending on who is applying and what they're applying for. And we're hoping that this can help simplify the process for anyone who's interested. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, DEP launched the It Pays to Plug-In program several years ago to provide grants to offset the cost of charging stations. The program offers up to $4,000 per port for level two chargers. Um, so far, we have allocated over $10 million for charging stations, and we are currently accepting applications for our wait list. So as new funding comes in, we pull applicants from the wait list on a first come first serve basis. So if your municipality or a business you know is thinking about installing chargers, um, tell them to apply so they can get on that list because it is first come first serve. And you can go to the next slide. We also have grants for public DC fast chargers. These are through competitive solicitation. Last year we held a corridor solicitation for fast chargers. These are near heavily traveled roadways. Um, we're anticipating to open another solicitation soon. And this will likely be for community chargers, which are um, in areas where people live and work. Um, so stay tuned for that. And you can go to the next slide. Our e-mobility program is also offered through solicitation. These projects are for electric ride hailing services, electric car share, um, electric shuttles, electric taxis, things like that. And these projects are really for overburdened communities, uh, communities, which take on more than their fair share of air pollution. You can go to the next slide. And we have another incentive program for replacing medium and heavy duty diesel vehicles with clean electric vehicles. These are vehicles like uh, garbage trucks, buses, tractor trailers, port equipment, 
And the funding also includes uh, for the charging infrastructure needed to um, power the vehicles. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, this is an example of an incentive program from one of our sister agencies, the NJEDA, and it's for businesses to purchase new medium duty zero emission vehicles. Um, the voucher is based on the gross vehicle weight rating of the vehicle, and there are also bonus criteria which add value to the base voucher. These include things like if the business applying is uh, woman owned, minority owned, veteran owned, if they're considered a small business, um, and there's a few other bonuses that uh, you could be eligible for, and these can all be stacked. Um, they're, so they're stacked up and then added to that base voucher, so uh, it can really help people get a new medium uh, duty vehicle. And next slide. The next couple of programs are offered through the Board of Public Utilities. The Clean Fleet EV Incentive Program supports local and state governments as they transition their fleets to electric. The number of vehicles and chargers they can apply for is tiered based on the population that they serve. Um, it's also recently been expanded to cover make ready costs and DC fast chargers. So uh, make ready is the pre-wiring of electrical infrastructure at a site. So that way it can easily accommodate a charger. So things like service panels, um, transformers, wiring upgrades, meters, those are covered under the make ready. And next slide. This is the second year of BPU's Charge Up New Jersey program, which offers up to $5,000 off the purchase or lease of a new electric vehicle. It was so popular that in just over two months since it reopened this year, as of September 15th, the funds have been maxed out, which is sad because they've been maxed out, but it's also very exciting because it shows us that people are ready to make the switch to an EV and these incentives are really helping them to do that. Um, the program will open at the next fiscal year. In the meantime, BPU um, is exploring additional funding and hopes to reopen it sooner. And next slide. BPU also approved utility incentives for EV charging, including for public fast chargers. They have approved PSENG and Atlantic City Electric's programs, which have launched so if you are in their territories, you can head to their websites and start that application process. Um, BPU hasn't approved Rockland Electric or JCPNL uh, proposals just yet. So if you're in those areas, uh, sit tight for now. And we go to the next slide. So in addition to our state agency partners, we also work with other groups. Some are at the very local level, like individual businesses or municipalities and some are at larger regional levels. Um, for example, we have our Destination Electric program that is part of the larger Drive Change, Drive Electric campaign. Um, Drive Change, Drive Electric is a public-private partnership between Northeast states and some automakers. And Destination Electric is a subset of that partnership that highlights small businesses in select towns that have charging stations nearby. Um, for this program in New Jersey, we work with Princeton, Jersey City, and Red Bank, as well as with the individual businesses within those towns. Um, we also work with Plug in America, Charge EBC, and NJ Car on the Plug Star dealership EV training program, so that salespeople at these car dealers are confident and knowledgeable in selling EVs. NJ Car also works with us when we host ride and drives by connecting us with local dealers to get vehicles um, for the event so people can test drive them. Um, the Transport Decarbonization Alliance is an example of a larger international public-private partnership. DEP has with um, other front-running cities, states, companies, and countries to accelerate the rollout of charging infrastructure. And these are just some examples of the partnerships that we have to accelerate uh, EV adoption. You can go to the last slide, I believe. Yes. Um, one really important way that you all as EV advocates can partner with us to help reach our mutual EV goals is to amplify and share our content. That can be as simple as um, liking or commenting on a social media post. It could be sharing that post to your own pages and groups. 
It could be forwarding a press release or an announcement through your email lists. And I'm sure most of you do this already, but if you, um, including EVs in your everyday conversations, because people value hearing from real people. Um, we can make all the incentive programs in the world, but if nobody knows about them or applies to them, then they wouldn't really be helping us reach our goals. And there's some links on this page. Um, there's our Drive Green website that I mentioned earlier. That's DEP's EV website. There's also our email list you can sign up for. If we have an announcement or we're announcing a new funding solicitation, we always push it out through our um, Gov Delivery mail list. Um, and then on the right is our social media links. The Drive Clean NJ Instagram link is our Bureau of Mobile Sources Instagram. So we always put out our EV updates there. So if you don't follow, you should follow. And of course, if anyone has questions, um, you can always email me. That's my email contact at the bottom. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to Leanne. Colleen, thank you so much. This is fantastic. And uh, I see how many programs you have in, uh, in DEP. And uh, speaking of collaboration, I think that we are already doing it. We share some of the links. Uh, we talk about electric and we have EV shows. This is our bread and butter as we like to speak. Um, is this uh, something that is, uh, to your expectation or how, how can we better uh, work together to the to common goal or? Yeah, no, that's that's really great. I know, um, I know Stan, when I shared the past couple of um, announcements with you through email, I see you always posted on the Facebook page. So that's a huge help. Um, I know mm -hmm. other groups that I send emails to also share. So that's, mm -hmm. that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, just sharing it with your followers because the more people get to see it on different right. platforms, you know, the more people know about it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's really great. Yeah, and, and we have, uh, so this is Central Jersey uh, chapter. We have also North Jersey Electric Vehicle Club and we have South Jersey Electric Vehicle Club. Uh, so we want to cover the whole state um, or beautiful garden state. <laughs> um, do we have any question from audience? I see in the chat, uh, somebody is asking about the utility incentive. Is it time of use charging? I think, it, so I'm in a PSCNG and they call it a load management program. And I don't know how the other utilities uh, in New Jersey call it, but uh, can you comment on that, Colleen? I would say to check out the individual websites, because like you said, they're probably different for each utility. Um, I have heard some of them incentivizing time of use charging, like if you charge in the off peak hours. Uh, but I would I would check out the websites individual to see if, yeah. if that's part of it. I can okay. comment that that uh, PSNG is extremely reluctant to offer a time of use. I asked them a year ago they replaced meter because they said I have to have new meter and they ended up giving me the same type of a meter. And when I urged them, hey, why didn't you give me the real stuff? They kind of knocked me down saying, oh, we have more important customers who lost power and you know, we have to send our technicians there. So um, I asked them again and they this year and they just installed it on Friday and I'm just waiting from the customer service department telling me, okay, now you're in um, mm -hmm. because the meter doesn't show exactly what I would expect, not yet, but I hope mm -hmm. it's uh, programmable remotely. What is the approximate timeline for Rockland Electric to launch their home charging program? That I don't know. Um... I would I would contact Rockland Electric. Um, yeah, I guess this is question specifically for the utility. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm not really sure on that. Is it managed by BPU or by DEP? The utility is um, through BPU. 
BPU, okay. Mm -hmm. Which actually gets me to a stupid question. How is BPU plugged into DEP? Plugged in. Like, what is the relationship? Well, we're, um, we're sister agencies, so we both work for um, the state of New Jersey. So BPU handles the utility side and we're the environmental protection side. Um, I don't know, well, can you right. expand that's... a little bit? Okay. It, it just happens that from the viewpoint of the EV advocate, there are programs within both. Mm -hmm. uh, because the utility, right, and the environmental mm -hmm. protection. And uh, some of the programs appear to be uh, like a very similar. Yes, yeah. yes, there's, because, a, there's a little bit of overlap. Um, yeah. So that's why in that incentives uh, summary document, if you want, I can I can drop the link in the chat, but it, it kind of separates who, because different people can apply for different things. So mm -hmm. like BPU has the clean fleet program where you can apply for uh, battery electric vehicles and charging stations, but we also have a charging station program. So they, they're they slightly different and I know it can get a little confusing. So I'm gonna try to drop that link in the yeah. chat. And you have also different. incentives for the heavy duty and medium duty vehicles. Yes. Which BPU does not have. Correct. Now, obviously there is a question about the charge up rebate. Um, I know that they had a straw proposal meeting. Uh, I think it was in uh, end of September. And so they were able to get another 20 million from the, from the, uh, what's called the fund anyway. And then I got the impression they were able to get 40 million additional on top of the original 30 million. But what I didn't hear back uh, is, uh, so what is the actual rebate? Is it 5,000 or is it dropped by 50%? I don't think they released those details yet. I know in the first year it was up to 5,000. And then in the second year, um, I'm sorry, it was up to 5,000 for vehicles under 55,000 MSRP. And then in the second year they changed it to, um, it was up to 5,000 for vehicles with MSRP under 45,000. And then they gave a lower amount for the vehicles between 45 and 55,000. So yeah. I mm -hmm. haven't, I haven't heard the new details yet, but once I do, I can um, I can let you all know. Can I ask a question? Because I, I I leased two vehicles. One uh, I have two electric vehicles. I leased one in March of this year, and I leased the second one in June. And I went to the website. It was very confusing. They're talking about no, oh, you missed the fiscal year. They didn't tell me what the fiscal year was. Uh, it just didn't, you know, there may be money available, but it's very difficult to get because it's very confusing. And it seemed like they ran out of money before they even posted it on the, on the website. I mean, it just didn't seem well organized at all. Am I getting the wrong take of this or have other people had that experience? Two cars that could, I could have collected they were both at the time uh, qualified for five thousand dollars each, mm -hmm. and all I got was a runaround for the state. I even um, called because the website was not helpful at all. I thought there was a phone number, and I called. And that person couldn't really answer the question either. Yeah, I know they um, they did update their website. Um, I think it's it's a little more clear now, but um, maybe when you had applied, it was the original format. So um, the fiscal year, I believe, is July. So that would have been when the program opened, and it did run out really quick. So July to September of 2021 is is the time span that they had it this year. So, so I just yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. You're, you're, yeah, you were just a little bit out of the time window um, with your purchase. 
you know, to base right. something on a fiscal year instead of a real year, the way the rest of us live, is just it's just wrong. You know, I mean, it's not explain your it to the life. whole state, you know. <laughs> yeah, well. My line is the state can't get the white lines on the highway right. But I just to defend the state, there are also companies that have um, completely different uh, fiscal years. I think P PNG they have a fiscal year that starts on September first. Uh, I know a lot of fiscal years don't start from January. You know they don't start in January or so, like that. And and the, the and the first incentive program actually started uh, on. January, pretty much 2020. So it, that created false impression that it's the beginning of fiscal year, but it was just after uh, governor uh, signed the law. So it started earlier and it was meant to last for essentially a year and a half, but they ran out of money in about 11 months. Uh, that was the first fiscal year. And the second, as Colleen mentioned, it started at the beginning of July this year and in less than two months, the money was gone. Well, I didn't count on it to begin with, and yeah. I was right. Good for you. Good for <laughs> so, you. Don't you count know, on so it. It would have been and, nice. And I, but... I, I, I continue telling people, don't count on, on the state program. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm going to jump in real quick. Stan, yeah. I don't and know and if I, it's, it's no, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm we have enjoying to the I'm enjoying the cars, so that's uh, what's important. Okay, uh, we I was to... just going to make a quick point about that, and that is that you know, Stan. I know I attended a lot of the BPU stakeholder meetings, and the one Stan's referring to at the end for people is like a public meeting, and you know they um, heard plenty. There was plenty of venting that was done mostly by organizations, people re uh, representing organizations rather than just community members. Um, but certainly a lot of people were, you know, they're aware of the shortcomings, but a lot of people did get the funding. And to your point, Gary, I'm also, my understanding of the second time around for the funding is that it's through the dealer. So there, it, it's really when you buy, it has to be a new vehicle, but when you buy it through the dealership, that there's really, they take it off the price and the dealership submitted the paperwork. So if you were within the time frame, you should, it would automatically have been given to you that it would be the dealer taking that 5,000, as they call it, cash on the hood, right, Colleen, that kind of. Yes, it, it so, did reopen as a cash on the hood, but I think his, he was, Gary, you said June maybe outside. and March. Yeah, both are outside yeah. of the window. Yeah, yeah. so the outside. Month, so right. they, the, bolt they, was they, in, the bolt was in March. I got a good deal on the bolt because they were they were kind of I traded in a 2018 lease on the bolt and got a pretty good deal on it. Another, you know, on another lease. It actually cost me less money per month than the 2018 bolt. Uh, and I went through great pains on the Tesla because I actually ordered it through the Devon store. I said, I have to take delivery in New Jersey to even qualify for the, for the uh, rebate. So we went all the way up to the Princeton store, just off the of US one, Lawrence Township, the, the Tesla store up there to take delivery on the Tesla. But as it turned out, <clears throat> both cars were out of the very short, <laughs> Uh, window of opportunity because of the money situation and the fiscal year and a moose past the full moon in Alaska. I think that was part of the deal, but something happened anyway. Um, so, you know, it just didn't work. And kind of well, I'm glad to see Robert is saying he was able to take advantage of the $5,000 rebate. And we know certainly as all the money, uh, several tens of millions of dollars that the, uh, the that we did rebates were given out so that's good and and um i i was told is that feedback anyone else hearing that we were told i believe at the last bpu call that when the funding does come back next year there's a good chance it will be smaller grants and maybe they'll even um bring the price down um you know so that it's not 
people, you know, buying Teslas and the more expensive vehicles. Um, who there was there was a lot of talk about, you know, maybe this incentive was not, you know, designed for for those vehicles at those price points. So at the, to at the time, the Tesla was qualified, but they've late raised yes. the price of the Tesla like three times. So right. now it's out so, of that range. But our yeah, Tesla it'll be interesting is, uh, to see qualified. what happens yeah. next year. But okay, I enough about that from me, Stan. Good. Could I, I'm um, sorry, this okay. is Scott. The, yes, go ahead, I, quick question. Hi, this is Scott Cohen. Sorry, I, I joined a little bit late, so maybe this was addressed already. Um, but Colleen, will there be, um, uh, shall we say specific or updated, well, specific and updated guidance um, prior to the start of the next fiscal? So if, so we can go to um, folks in the community to, you know, cause we are, shall we say, EV educators, whenever we're talking to folks, to be able to uh, explain, you know, what, 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 the, what the protocol will be, what the process will be when they do, if somebody is interested in purchasing an electric vehicle, what their expectations should be with regard to the car buying process, what the dealer will do, what, what, what the uh, consumer has to do, what forms they have to complete, things like that. Yeah, so this is for the EV rebate from BPU. Yeah, yeah so you know, prior, prior to um, July 1st. Yeah, I mean, our hope is always that we have a little bit of a heads up of what's going on so we can let people know. But honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know that I could say for sure. Um, but we do, as soon as we get those notices, we send them out on our newsletters. And I know um, BPU has also... Um, I think the charge up rebate has its own email list um, that I'm on just so I can keep track to see if they send anything out. So I can forward that to you all. Um, as soon as we find out something, I can, I can send it out to you so you can do that. And that would actually be really helpful. That's, that's some of the partnerships and uh, educating that I was talking about. It's really helpful from EV advocates like you guys. Thank you. So do we have any more questions? Because if not, I would like to thank uh, Colleen once again. Thank you so much. It was very, very nice to, uh, to present uh, and, and join our uh, meeting. Now, um, you are more than welcome to hang out for the rest of the meeting. If you have to go, we understand. So, um, No, I'm going to hang out. I also just dropped the incentive summary link in the chat Excellent. just so you all can see. Excellent. But yeah, I'll, I'll hang out and listen to the rest of the meeting. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So I'll go to the next speaker. And our next speaker is Leanne. And Leanne was already speaking today. And most of you uh, know Leanne, but let me introduce her formally. Uh, our next speaker, Leanne McGowan, uh, she handles business development, employer services, and sustainability for RideWise, an independent nonprofit and the Transportation Management Association serving Somerset County. One of Leanne's programs is New Jersey Smart Workplaces, a statewide program which recognizes employers for supporting commuters and offering transportation related sustainability, safety and wellness information and programs to employees. These efforts include helping workplaces and municipalities with EV education and workplace charging, which is where her EV journey began. Through the EV Coalition, Lien launched uh, in 2020 uh, with uh, the help of many partners, including Central Jersey Electric Auto Association. Collaboration and group discussion um, are central to engaging others in advancing electric vehicle adoption. So without further ado, can you see the slides? I can. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, and thank you, Colleen. You're a, you're a tough act to follow, and uh, it's wonderful to, to be um, you know, doing programs with you, I, uh, uh, usually in the audience. Um, I also want to welcome and say hello to 
uh, the CJEAA members and other people, some people brand new. I think Gary said this was his first time. And a special guest, a surprise guest, that Moises Luque is with us today. He, speaking of being an advocate, and as Colleen said, you know, amplifying the message and sharing the programs and putting information out through email blasts and liking social media posts. I feel like Moises does all the above. And um, we're excited to be featuring him in our January program, which I'll mention in a few minutes. And I also want to give a shout out to Tracy Woods, also from Sustainable Jersey, also a great partner. Um, and Stan, I think I said you, but I'll say you again. So thank you. Um, okay, moving on to the next couple You're slides. Welcome. Very quickly, as Stan said, Rodwise is the Transportation Advocacy Organization, or TMA, serving Somerset County as a navigator, resource, educator, on um, safe, efficient, and sustainable transportation. And so we are trying to connect uh, people to EV information and accelerate adoption through all of our channels in the community, in the business world, with our county partners and various stakeholders. So now we can go to the next slide. And I really hope that my family does not make too much noise. My apologies if you can hear them. Everybody's done with finals. And so there's a lot of uh, socializing starting in the McGowan household. Okay, so this is my area. TMAs serve many different audiences. We have many different programs, but I specifically work with employers and municipalities fall into that schools. So Leanne, uh, I jump into uh, your mic microphone is acting up. If you s oh. don't speak straight into the microphone, it doesn't pick it up well. I'm going to face this way and say this. It's tough because I have a dual screen. So my apologies. <laughs> okay. So Sorry, I don't know where I cut out, but these are some of our programs and some of our audiences just to give you a snapshot of what we do. And as I said, I focus on employers and um, that is an audience that with the pandemic, it is, has been more difficult to reach over the past couple years. And that is, as Colleen and, and Stan and all of you would agree, an audience we're really trying to get through to. And so that's something that we need to, to figure out a little bit, especially as a lot of our larger corporate campuses are, um, are pretty empty these days. Um, so focusing on the smaller and the medium-sized business um, over the coming months. Um, okay, next slide, please, Stan. Just some of the presentations that I used to do a lot of in person that we've transitioned many of these to virtual um, the electric vehicle presentations have not continued over the past year or so, but that's where, you know, I decided to launch a coalition instead, and we try to pull people in through that, and also doing in-person EV ride and drives and things as we did with CJEAA in September. Next slide, please. And these are three of the goals of the coalition that we are helping Somerset County, the Office of Planning, Policy and Economic Development with. Um, so this fits in with our mission. And so this is where we decided we could help. And most of our programs kind of fall into these, fall into these areas and cater to these groups. Next slide, please. And this, it's time for a new slide because we have, got, this one is crowded from our um, programs over the past year, but um, we mix it up with our topics and who we cater to. It could be fleet analysis month, one month and something um, on charging in municipalities. We have partnered with uh, CJEA on a college, on a program geared toward college students and Gen Z drivers. Uh, so we have really covered uh, a variety of topics and will continue to do so. Next slide, please. And these are just some of the partners that I could recall. 
Um, I would put NJDEP on there as well. We hadn't done any formal program, but I feel like we're certainly a partner in terms of sharing information and um, referring people to your programs and the grants. Um, and I suppose we're partnering tonight, but, um, and I know, you know, with Tracy on the call, we, we did a program with her. We are constantly trying to either bring people into our programs and not try to do programs on our own, but with other organizations or, um, you know, having meetings and connecting people and having new and different conversations all the time and trying to get groups um, to, to talk about things and how to advance EV adoption with other groups just to get those different perspectives. Next slide, please. And this is what I was referring to a few minutes ago with Moises, how in January we are working with um, NJEDA, the NJ ZIP program. This, that's the first time for us. And with Moises and his business, Supreme Green Team, and also with the Franklin Township Chamber of Commerce to get their perspective on how we can um, you know, help businesses and business and municipalities can work together and the you know special considerations for women and minority business enterprises and um, you know what's available and really what what the gaps are that's a big part of what we're trying to do is is identify the needs and connect people to services and information that can help them next slide please might be it. Um, and one other point, I had it on the slide earlier. It was a little tiny icon of a, of a crock pot. Um, and I, I believe there was somebody from one of the other TMAs that I saw on the, um, on the Zoom here earlier. But I decided that it was time for TMAs to um, work a little bit more in conjunction with each other. And that there are eight TMAs in New Jersey, Ridewise is one. And so with the seven, with representatives from the seven others, we are starting to meet monthly to, um, you know, talk about the work we're doing, where we need help, what are our strengths, what are our, you know, what are we less, what areas are we less strong in that we could partner with others. And we're doing a lot of information sharing around the state. And it's nice to see that working. Um, for instance, today I just got a, a request from another TMA. They needed help answering some questions from one of their municipalities. And I was able to refer them to the It Pays to Plug In grant and invite them to tonight's program. And I think that's, you know, we're starting to see um, a little bit more collaboration over the coming year with TMAs. And so what we can do is what RodeWise is trying to do in our service area of Somerset County is, you know, spread the information, work with our partners. And, you know, this way we can cover the state. And I sort of see us like NJDEP and the BPU and all those large organizations, you know, they have a lot of influence and power and money, but they're slower movers, right? They're larger organizations and, you know, the TMAs, a little bit more of the boots on the ground, we can do things, we're more agile, we can do things quicker and, and we're a connector. So I hope to be able to, you know, play a little bit more of a role between, you know, getting some of the information, you know, top down and, and bottom up, and if the TMAs can help with that. Um, I see a question in the chat, Ira, if you didn't hear earlier, or um, a TMA is a transportation management association, and there are eight of us in New Jersey and we, we get state and federal funding. And we do a lot of um, information and resource sharing and education and advocacy um, for sustainable transportation. So um, we each have different roles, but um, you know, some of us actually provide transportation. Uh, many TMAs don't provide transportation at all. RideWise would be in that category. So, hope that answers that question. And that's really it for my presentation. I 
would love to have a, a program where we sort of brainstorm on um, and you know get all different organizations onto a Zoom. And if CJA would ever like to be a part of that, um, you know, over the coming year, that would be great. Leanne, thank you so much for pitching in and for uh, sharing your deck. It was uh, it was very nice. Uh, I also uh, was happy to learn that there are more TMAs, transportation management agencies, as I also learned what the abbreviation means. Uh, being a very near to New Brunswick, I know of Keep Middlesex moving. Are they considered one of them? Yeah, they are. And they have been very active with EVs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they, they do a good amount of programming. I, I know Bill Neary. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and uh, Ira was asking about uh, TMAs a little bit north. Uh, I think he was talking about Essex. Although, um, Ira, you are from Bergen County or Sussex? Ber no, I, I'm from Bergen. But Bergen, yeah. When we're talking about employers. My employer happens to be in Newark, so that's why I was just trying to. Ah, okay. I've been, I've been really trying to push them to get mm -hmm. into this, you know, this very important uh, business of EVs and, you know. Yeah, whatever. Leanne, can you can you name from top of your head uh, any of these other eight agencies? I I can, although I'll, I'll probably not be so good at remembering exactly because some some TMAs represent several counties. Um, it was Trans Options who was, re, who was on the Zoom tonight. And um, I believe they are, um, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say wrong with their, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back and put that in the chat. There is easy, there is in, in South Jersey, several counties is cross county connection. Mm -hmm. KMM keep Middlesex moving. Then there's Rodwise right in the center in Somerset. And then there's Greater Mercer TMA, which is Mercer County and possibly another um, Go Hunterdon, I believe is just Hunterdon. And I think Trans Options is, is Sussex and Warren and um, I think possibly another county. And then there's, there's Hudson, there's over Hudson County with several others. And um, I think that's Easy Ride. And there's probably another one or two I am missing. My apologies. No oh, problem. hey, Yathar saw on the call, right? Easy Ride covers Bergen County. Okay, so whoever was just, was that Scott? Might have been asking about that. You're- That, that, that was Ira. And I, I mentioned, I mean, no, it's okay. I mentioned Accessor Ride, but Easy Ride, um is uh is, is a group that i did some work with when i was working with uh uh bergen community college perfect and then and um yeah thank you so much he put the link in the chat there's a nice nap uh, a nice map that shows all the tmas and the um the counties they serve so yes Thanks. thank you Leon. i'm actually uh new to easy new and easy ride and i'm also learning so <laughs> I will let you know more about the EV Ride program shortly. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions about that or other TMAs, just feel free to email me, leanne at ridewise.org. I want to make sure that um, in our next newsletter, we will advertise your uh, January 27th uh, coalition meeting, right? Sounds great. Yeah, and uh, it's, is it, I guess it's open for uh, every member of our organization, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so, it's and really I would like to encourage everyone because, you know, um, being all volunteers, uh, sometimes attending these meetings, meaning stealing time from our employers. <laughs> and uh, so I, I cannot guarantee that I can uh, always have the luxury of attending every of, of the coalition meetings, but you know, um, anyone who is available, please attend um, RideWise coalition meeting. Thank you. I guess that was your last slide. Yes. Do we have more questions to Leanne? This is the email address, right? So any further 
questions, you can always uh, contact Leanne. Uh, now, let's see what happens when I click the next slide. Oh, okay, that's expired. Expired, okay. <laughs> um, we do not, okay, so the, the, un, the only th uh, next event that we are loosely planning, and I didn't put slide into it, is uh, last year we had a um, uh, drive-through, a Christmas light or holiday, holiday lights, uh, and it was in P PNC in Red Bank. Uh, wonderful, beautiful lights. The only problem is the line. The line of, of vehicles, it went beyond any uh, reasonable point for, you know, where we could hang out. Um, I was asking uh, Alex and Alex, he could not uh, attend today. Um, th this year I would contemplate um, in East Brunswick, um, they have, um, the Wonder Light uh, show, it's um, every day, it's already happening until January 2nd or something like that. Um, I would love to go there um, and maybe we can go there as a group. It's kind of late to call it in, plus um, uh, all these uh, funny things happening with uh, pandemic lately. What is your opinion? Do we have people from Central Jersey here or all around New Jersey? Oh, I'm, I'm from Bergen. Bergen here as well. Yeah, there's a lot of Northern New Jersey folks on this call. Yeah. I live, I live there's two a, minutes from the light show in East Brunswick. There's also you? a light show in... Um, Right in yeah. Bergen County, right off the Parkway. That's far. That's far for a lot of people. But yeah, and plus, uh, being a sustainability fellow, I would not encourage anyone from uh, one corner of uh, New Jersey going to another one, or even East Brunswick is in Central Jersey, uh, essentially. But um, okay, um, I think uh, that would be it for today. Um, oh, Stan, yes? can I, uh, I have a little breaking news, uh, if you don't mind me Go sharing ahead. something. This it is not my, my, it's not my scoop. It, the scoop is for uh, the fabulous Haley Berliner that uh, it writes for Environment New Jersey, and many of you know her, uh, just posted uh, last week about the BPU um, doing a new multi-unit dwelling incentive program. And I just put the link to the article in all of your, um, in the chat. And um, BPU says they're going to start promoting it after the um, holidays. You know, they didn't want it to get lost in the shuffle, but I thought all of you as people who do outreach, you know, in the EV world would be interested in seeing this. And you know how um, obsessed I am with multi-unit uh, dwelling out, uh, doing outreach for- Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's an equity stuff. thing. So absolutely. So is, is the program open uh, uh, to everyone who meets the uh, condition uh, of multi-unit dwelling or is it focused to environmental justice communities or disadvantaged communities? So all we have on it, um, you can go to the board um, meeting and like scan through it and try to find because apparently they described the whole thing in that uh, board meeting, but I haven't had time to do that. So we don't have the the um, rules yet or anything like that. All we have is Haley's article that she wrote. Um, so we don't really, or I personally don't really know all the little tiny details yet, but just okay. sort of the, um, you know, prepare to be very excited about this. <laughs> we are talking about it in our township Franklin Environmental Commission uh, a lot because um, we, we are aware of, of this, um, that, that we need to broaden uh, charging capability for people who do not have driveway or garage. Uh, we are talking a lot about pole mounted charging stations or street light uh, uh, mounted charging stations. And the only thing I'm a little disappointed about is they don't have any incentives for level one. Um, 
Right. But I mean, I guess that uh, level two is good too. <laughs> well, Tracy, the it pays to plug in program offers level one charging and uh, multi unit dwellings would be eligible for that. Um, that's I, true. I think yeah. it's $750 per charger. Um, and there's a minimum of, I want to say, 10 chargers that you have to install. But that's part of our, I know I just mentioned the level two in my, in my spiel, because that's usually where people go, but, but we do have the level one there as well. Which actually reminds me that I wanted to check with you, Colleen, about the new EV ordinance, uh, which mandates um, charging capability for new developments. Because as we are uh, in our environmental commission, when we are going through site plans, I have more questions than answers. <laughs> like, uh, you know, so we see a site plan for, of a developer and there is a whole shopping mall and they want to change a section of it. And you have parking spots here and there. How do you calculate those 15%? Okay, um, I can, because that's through um, NJDCA. If you want to email me your question, and I can, um, I can find out for you. Okay. Um, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I don't have, I don't have a more exact answer, <laughs> but I can find out. <laughs> I don't have, I guess, uh, simple questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, you know. Uh, site plans like uh, storage facilities, you know, where this is the last place where I would think of charging my car <laughs> and they are included, right? Uh, so um, that, that's very interesting or, or warehouses, right? So, um, but you know, some, some uh, employees uh, who work at the warehouse, if they have parking spots, right, and 15%, they have to be um, they have to be charge ready. Five percent has to be uh, directly fitted with the charging stations, and you know maybe it's off topic, but um, I was thinking how how would I actually install if I'm making a large development? Uh, because fifteen percent can be done in a smart way and in a stupid way, so to speak. What I'm talking about is, you know, the level two, you can charge your vehicle in, you know, up to, I mean, it certainly it's gonna be nine hours, but people typically don't discharge their vehicles. But let's say that we are talking about um, multi-dwelling unit, right? And there is a parking lot and 15% and has to be fitted, right? So, um, Today, there is not so much demand. So you can say that 15% is plenty, right? But is it really future-proofing? So what I'm talking about, you plug the vehicle when you arrive back home. And before you go to bed, the vehicle could be fully charged. And the load all goes to the after hours. Um, I mean, uh, just after you... Uh, arrive home. So, so it's essentially the, the load demand is the highest uh, around 5, 6, 7 p.m. And this is the time when people would arrive and plug it. And uh, so after the, the vehicles are charged, the, the, vehicle, the, the, the parking spot is, the charging station is unused. If there is always um, so if they are spaced every other, so they use dual charger, right? And the, the mentality is we'll put them right next to each other, right? But if you have additional one empty spot, I'm calling it empty, essentially general parking spot next to official charging spot, the court can actually reach to the next one. So what, what I'm trying to say is that for the future proofing, it's better to space them out a little bit more so that down the road, when you need to go from 15% to maybe 30%, you don't need to install additional charging station. You just say, this spot is for charging from 
let's say 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And the other one from 9 p.m. to morning, right? Because you don't want people to come at the middle of the night. And the trick is that as opposed to asking someone to vacate the, the spot, you just tell, okay, this spot is from 9, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And the next person will just unplug the, the already charged vehicle and plug the, the vehicle that is sitting next to uh, next to it, which originally was not labeled for electric vehicles, but as uh, the popularity grew, it could be actually just painted, hey, this is, you know, satellite electric vehicle charging spot, and the court can actually reach that spot. Don't, so, don't, some, car, don't some cars lock the, uh, the charge? Well, uh, this is, I call it technical detail. <laughs> you essentially, you have to make sure that uh, when your vehicle is charged, anyone can unplug it. Hey, Stan, why, why not um, mount the charger between spots? That's additional investment. No, 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 no. Instead of, instead of so in, so a typical EV charging spot has the ubiquitous sign, EV charging only that, ice drivers, you know, combustion engine drivers may or may not um, uh, read after yes. they, they, they stop their car. Mm -hmm. But instead of having the charger, shall we say, at the nose centered on a parking spot, you just have it okay. centered, well, centered between parking spots because that, that's what you're proposing is that if you're iced or if there's a that, car that's, that's the default. Charged. That's the default because we are talking about dual charger. And it's in between. Oh, and, I see. And so one I dual know. is for one, and the other one is for the other. What I'm talking about, actually, the cord is long enough to go to the next two positions that are really? sitting. Okay. Yes. It, so, so that, so I guess what you'd have to specify is a minimum length cord, because I guess well, some, I, I think some vendors maybe 20 feet, 18 feet, 25. I, feet. I think what is available today, default, I think it's 15 feet will be perfectly fine. What may right. happen that you have to park your vehicle such that uh, either nose in or back in so that the court can reach it. And I'm talking about the, the satellite spaces, okay? Not the original, but the satellite spaces. Does it make sense? I mean, uh, Tracy, you are the expert. I mean, I've seen some charging stations that are able to, like if you plug in one um, level two charger, then it gets the full amount. And it, it, can, it can either be um, set to throttle down the output at, you know, on a timed schedule, or it can be set that if somebody plugs in the other port of the dual nozzle, that they share the output. So you know that you're still sharing one circuit between two, um, two cars because you know the uh idea is, is that they're going to be charging there longer you know they're not each going to be there for three hours they're going to be there for six or eight hours a piece and so they split you know the the machine's capable of splitting so, the available um electricity between them so so th i was not exactly addressing that one i was thinking that so as you have each nozzle of the dual charger so that when the primary vehicles are charged, then another person can come and, and charge the other two vehicles, which are sitting in uh, positions that originally were not labeled as EV charging spots because it would be more than 15%. And perhaps because at that time, like today, there are not enough electric vehicles, so you don't need to hog so many spots. But as a future proofing, what I'm thinking of that instead of building more charging stations above and beyond 15%, you just label the adjacent spots to be uh, for EV vehicles, for, for electric vehicles. And so one nozzle uh, works in conse consequentially. So you plug one vehicle and then you plug another vehicle. The whole reason is uh, to avoid people coming and relocating their vehicles. Uh, because this is today a common practice. When your vehicle is fully charged, 
you are supposed to walk, uh, t bring the, uh, take the vehicle out so that somebody else can, can charge. But instead of moving the vehicle, if we can just move the nozzle from one vehicle to another, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. I, you know, the one thing that comes to mind, uh, uh, Colleen, as you rightfully pointed out, that the the charging uh, the stations um, will will split the the power between the the um, the the available plugs or the plugs that are active. So if you know, let's say um, the both, you know, the, the entire uh, station puts out 16 kilowatts, that's eight kilowatts each. Um, I think Stan, to your point, it would be really cool is it, if um, you could just have a, a bounty of plugs and not worry about painting, painting lines or, or specifying locations, just having, <laughs> having the plug available. Yes, but, so you just move. Just so you just move the plug. I'm I'm thinking maybe you go even one step further, which is, if you could imagine, you have, what you could you could imagine having one charging station serve four spots. So let's say you have, you know, four course. spots nose to nose, and you could have, um, honestly, if you you could have a charging station that could have, shall we say, four plugs in it. Sharing one, one, um, one, uh, uh, one circuit. Yeah, scatter field. exactly. Once, yeah, but but I was then, just going to say, if you're going to do that, and yeah. you're, you know, you'd have to move the cord around all evening. You could put in four level one charging spaces. Everybody plugs in when they get home. Nobody has to come out and move the cord. And you know, the the level one charging spaces cost about five hundred dollars a piece. So you're still less than half the cost of you know that, that's if somebody comes in right right and, i mean and, i mean i keep depending on the size of the battery sorry to cut you off we're all so excited about this topic so feel free yeah. to say all right enough but um <laughs> you know if 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 somebody pulls in with a a 150 kilowatt pack at state of charge near zero and then i pull in with my with my nero which has a 64 kilowatt pack and i'm at 50 percent you know instead of me moving the car, maybe the, the, the brains of the charging infrastructure at that site could figure out, oh, okay, Scott's done charging. Let's, let's give, the, uh, let's give the, the 100D that's parked opposite him, you know, full charge at this point. You know, instead of having to text, you know, somebody in a, in a multi-unit dwelling to say, hey, it's three o'clock in the morning, You're, you can charge now. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, Tracy, what, what you are saying about the level one, it's pretty much the same mentality here. You know, you either have lots of level one uh, nozzles and everybody plugs in the evening and it slowly trickles until morning, or you have something faster and then you give everyone, you know, two or three hours so that you charge faster here and then you replug, replug, replug. I mean, it, it is a hassle, um, but it's kind of cheaper having one plug serving more vehicles at higher speed than uh, having more plugs at lower speed. Um, but I, I, I think we need to just decon deconvolute. It will take time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that in some jurisdictions, there will be a preferred push for level one, and we will see the benefit Right. Ultimately, it's about balancing the load. Right. So you don't you don't want everyone to to plug in a, a, and uh, in the evening evening early evening and uh, and uh, the whole grid will collapse. <laughs> um, yeah. And and uh, having the the systems artificial intelligence decide when you uh, charge. Uh, and it can happen at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., as, as Scott mentioned, then the vehicle has to be already physically plugged in, right? So, yeah, I guess it's um, um, lots of factors to, to decide, but I think it's, it's exciting. We, we, can, we can definitely do it. We can transition all gas cars to electric. I mean, we are all on the same boat here.
Um, what do we have in the chat? Block share. Okay. Yeah. Sure. No, I, I just um, I just put that in the in the in the chat. My my daughter's college um, up in Rochester. Obviously, it's a it's a college, so they have lots and lots of parking spaces. Mm -hmm. They have it set up so that um, you know so that um, a given charger has actually access to four uh, you know, four four parking spots. Um, but it's a it's a college, so they have lots of open space and they have loads of parking. You know that that most stores around here obviously wouldn't you know um, have extra. So that way people can can go ahead and unplug and plug, you know, um, uh, without having I to see the pictures, uh, yeah. but these are still dual chargers. So yeah. you have two parking spots per one nozzle. Um, oh, OK. I, I thought they were just a dual charger for four spots. Okay. Yeah, dual charger, one dual for four spots. So you have yeah. one nozzle per two spots. Yeah. Oh, OK. That's, I'm sorry. I thought that's what you were talking about. I'm sorry. OK. Yeah. And this is certainly good. And they are not really labeled as uh, uh, EV spots, at least not on the pavement. Uh, but uh, the posts, they they probably say that I cannot read everything in detail. Yeah, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's, it's 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 labeled that. And, yeah, and it and is. it's a college, okay. so they'll ticket you if you're, mm -hmm. if you're not allowed to park there. But uh, yeah. right there. Okay. So. Um, I guess uh, that is it. I'm loosely planning the next presentation, uh, next meeting in February, February 2nd. Um, and uh, yeah, um, 22 should be exciting year, lots of new models. Uh, we will have Drive Electric Earth Day in uh, April. So stay tuned um, if you have, uh, any organization that wants to participate by any means, we are going to support everything and everyone who we can. We have uh, Raritan Valley Community College lined up uh, for, I think, end of April. And uh, I think uh, I would like to see some workplaces, more workplaces. Um, because it's very well attended. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for hanging out. Um, and uh, if you have no more questions. Um, oh yeah, uh, one more thing I should have mentioned during the chair report. So Electric Auto Association has officially changed name to Electric Vehicle Association. And that's applicable to the national um, headquarters in, in California. Um, none of the chapters are forced to follow the suit. Uh, after all, before the name change, uh, some of the chapters already chose to have name Electric Vehicle Association, but specifically in California. And some uh, chapters uh, have neither in their name. Um, some of them are even called clubs. So yeah, that's that's probably the last piece I want to mention. And I want to wish everyone happy holidays and very successful new year. So 